Mike asked me to give this talk, it was uh, at a request from somebody in the crowd here that wanted something about wild bees. Uh, so it's, I'm kind of a little schizoid today because I'm going to do something about wild bees, but before we get there, I wanted to uh, touch base with what's happening in the world of our honeybees. So this is an example of what's going on if um, you think about our diet is about 130 uh, directly or indirectly benefited from pollinators and this is an example in these pictures of what you would have on your plate if you have pollinators and if you don't have pollinators. One of the major problems is, is there's a lot of things affecting bees and it's not just pesticides. There's large-scale agriculture, there's habitat destruction, there's urbanization that's going on around us all the time. I mean, here on the shore, I mean, in the 30 years I've been here, it's amazing the amount of houses and buildings that have been put up. And this is another real culprit for our bees, is monoculturing. As you know, you can go for miles and miles on the shore here and you see a lot of soybeans, you see a lot of field corn. But that's, that's like a bee flying across the desert. There's nothing there for them to eat. In suburban areas, especially on the western shore, they don't want, to, they don't want clover in their yards. They want to have that Scots turf everywhere. It's another di disaster for the bees in that respect. So mon monocultures are definitely having an effect. They're reducing the amount of forage bees can get, and it's, uh, that is directly affecting the bees' nutrition. And when you have your nutrition go down, you go down. So this is one of the things that's happening. We also had a problem in 1986. We had an introduced parasitic mite, uh, Varroa mite, that came into the country, and it nearly knocked half the bee population out of the country with it. Um, this is what the mite looks like. It looks, it looks like a crab, if it was bigger we could eat it. <coughs> so we've had honeybee losses, well let's do it historically. We, before we had mites in the 80s, there was an average of about 10 to 15 percent bee loss every year, whether it was through starvation or thermal regulation or some other factor. We were losing about that much, but after mites re, re, were introduced, that population, that re, uh, introduction uh, losses was up to 25 percent since the in initiation of quote CCD or as I like to say the movement to California our, our honeybee populations have dropped to, to at least 30 percent on average for the last six years. We, we think that if we could get back to this old 10 to 15 percent level that we had in the mid 80s we'd be pretty sustainable as far as beekeeping going. In the eastern shore of Maryland, one of our biggest problems, and this is all, I'm also getting feedback from western shore too, is winter hive losses. This is a scale that was put into, uh, was surveyed in Virginia by Bill Tickner, he's the uh, inspe apiary inspector for there, and his losses are, are pretty consistent with what we're seeing here in Maryland. This year I'm getting a lot of calls already that there's bees that are dying, you know, that, or dead for that matter. And uh, it could be what we think is we had a wacky year last year, we had drought, we had early spring, and things just got a little twisted in the bees' mind, if, as you would say. And uh, we're, so now we're seeing the results of that. We're seeing much more losses. All right, currently the demand for honey bees in California is so strong that beekeepers from all across the U.S. send the bees to pollinate this one crap. I just got some information today. Beehives are renting for, in California for $200 a hive, for, and they need enough to cover 76,000 acres out there. So that means we're pulling in, they're pulling in one and a half million hives from across the United States to California, and California is producing another half a million hives just to do the pollination out there. This is an example, shows you an example of this. We've maxed out. There's, there's, you know, we, there's probably, it's like, on the next slide I'll show you, well, maybe the next one after that. There's, um, there's not enough bees to go around anymore. If we send them all to California, they come, when bees come back from California, they're beat up, they're, they're, they're th low in numbers, and it's at exactly the time when we need to have high numbers and enough uh, effective bees to, for pollination. 
Uh, so we have choices. We have importing bees from other countries to look for using wild bees as pollinators. That's why we're talking today. Of all the native wild bees, though, um, there's only a few that can work as commercial pollinators in America. And some of those can't work here or they're specialized to work only certain crops. But the best, the best choice we have is, is to build better bees. And we do, we've got several bee breeding programs going on. There's bee breeding programs going on in California. There's bee breeding pro programs initiating here in Maryland, in fact. So we are trying to build a better queen. We're trying to build a queen that can survive our pollination needs and our climate, because our climate is changing and we're, we're having real problems with it. Like I say, this is one of the problems. Bees are hauled into to California in wagons or trucks. For four, let's say I leave, I leave Florida, it's going to take me at least four days to haul that bee across the, the country. And all that time he's in a box, sealed up, can't do anything, can't go to the bathroom. And then they get out there, they're put into an area in California that they, where they go through inspection where there's absolutely nothing to eat. So they have to feed them sugar water once they get out there. And it just compounds the effect. So that we wonder when we see these massive die-offs out in these uh, inspection fields. Then they're moved into the pollen, pollinating practices on these almond trees. And literally, when you go out there uh, during the pollination season, this whole ground is covered with dead bees because of the, uh, every day, these big almond growers are spraying their trees and they're spraying these bees and killing them off. So we're really get these, they, they come back really debilitated. So you have stress factors contributing to bee declines. You have management, which is the movement of these bees, how we're handling them. You have the poor nutrition from, you know, having a constant only one food re resource to work with. You have raw mites, and you do have pesticides, not just insecticides. You have secondary pathogens. Let's say a mite bites a bee, he transfers a virus, and then the virus takes out. Or you have other diseases that are just waiting to take effect if the nutrition goes down in the bee sufficiently for them to invade their gut and then proceed through the rest of the body. So this is what, I was, what these things are. Fungi, usually we get fungi problems because they're directly related to stress. Our chemicals of, to blame for honeybee die-offs it's, it's, it is possible that materials used correctly according to our recommendations and guidelines can, unknowing to us, be a factor. And one of the ones that have become more and more apparent is this uh, one that we talk about, you hear uh, this morning a little bit about, it, synergism. It's where, the, where we're combining either a, a treatment of an insecticide with a fungicide, or we're putting the insecticide on first and then the fungicide later, but once they get mixed into that plant or that crop, something happens between the two chemicals and you actually make something that's a little bit more lethal than you had at the beginning. So many kinds of pesticides, including herbicides, insecticides, fumigants, fungicides, antibiotics, surfactants, stickers are all used in their crops and all or some have effects on bees. Time of use is a, also is a major factor. So there's been a lot of talk right now about the neonics. You have uh, Admire, you have uh, Platinum, you have Venom, Asael, Belay, Calypsos. Some of these are definitely worse problems than others. Um, we're seeing like, th um, let me see, I'm trying to, Clothiodin, when it breaks down, or, or th Thymoxam, when it breaks down, it breaks down to cloth Clothiodin. Uh, Imidacloprid breaks down into five different materials. But they're all applied differently or the same. And they all can have a far-reaching effect later into the season. Now, the last year, we've been talking about using imidacloprid or neonicotinoids in corn plantings and with uh, direct seeded and the talc is blowing up out that they use to make the seed flow correctly. It's blowing up into the air and then it's floating over to, out of the field into like winter annuals that are growing next to the field. And then the bees are forging in those winter annuals are getting knocked off. So it's a way that the stuff is moved. I'm, I'm, su I'm surprised that people that are planting corn are not complaining more about this because when you're getting that talc, talc up in the air, you're breathing it too. It's eventually gonna cause emphysema. 
So you need to uh, consider these things yourself. So you have, the, like I said, you have these two groups. With uh, the cyan group is a little bit less lethal, as you can see, it's seven, seven to fifteen micrograms, whereas the uh, nitro group is uh, between 0.02 and 0.08 percent. But that's not to say that there's other insecticides that we're using that are just as lethal, eth equally lethal as the neonics. And especially with the, uh, where's Brian? Oh, he's gone. <laughs> we're spraying a lot, lot of stink bug stuff out there. And that stink bug stuff can have an effect on our honeybees. We, and it's the same thing he's talking about in those orchards. He's spraying that clay material, that powder. It's what's growing on that understory in those orchards out there. You know, could that be affecting that uh, bees foraging on that understory? Uh, so there's there's a lot of stuff that ne still needs to be addressed in this. One of the ways I always look at it is think of the bee as a mop. It picks up everything, everything that's out there in the environment. It'll pick up and it'll bring home. And you have to understand, you may be doing everything right, but the guy down the street or the guy a mile away may not be doing everything right because bees can forage up to 8,000 acres from their location. They don't usually, but they can. So there's ample opportunities. I mean, you could be next to Harry, a homeowner that's running a, a turf field in his backyard, spraying and treating for that, and you're doing what you're doing right and he's doing what he's doing right for his, but you're getting a, a lethal dose off of that. Yeah. So, in, as far as ratios go, in, in honey, um, since bees are mops, so their spit probably has a whole bunch of uh, hyperaccumulation of uh, fungicides and insecticides and things like that. Has anybody looked or assayed? Yeah, we were doing that. I got some graphs here. Um, we're not finding it in the honey, but. They're also, the bees not only make spit, but they also have sweat, bee sweat, which uh, is actually wax. And we're finding that most of these materials are being funneled out through the wax. Well, that makes sense because they're hydrocarbons, right. they're more soluble right. than the wax, right? Right, so, that, so that's, that's how that movement is going. So we're not seeing it so much in the honey because it's a water base. We're seeing it in the, in the bees' wax itself. So, what's that doing for us selling beeswax to the cosmetic industry? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, you may want to think twice about buying comb honey or chunk honey and just buy the liquid honey. <laughs> all right. So you have all of these different exposure ways, you know, that, can be, that bees can be exposed to the different things. You can have it done directly and the pollen that picks it up, you can, you know, this is the beekeeper, and I want to tell you right up front, beekeepers are the world's worst as far as residue in their hives. We're, we put more residue in our hives than anybody else out here. Okay, you have the neonics affecting colony health. We're looking at long-term uh, health reasons there. We're not, we're not looking at acute, we're looking at chronic, and we'll get a little bit more into that later. So you have pesticide interactions, which are uh, sublethal, uh, synergistic. You have the sublethal effects. We're talking about a chronic effect over time. Not this generation, maybe not the next generation, but that third generation comes up and gets whammed. And maybe that's the generation that we're supposed to go through winter with. Okay? And then you have other interactions with all those other stressors that are out there, disease, mites, other factors that could be doing it. So, there's quite a lot of ways that the beehive, bees are being uh, uh, d damaged. But here, this is, this is just a partial list. We've done out to 272 different chemicals now. And you can see there's quite a roundup a line of them. Um, I, f I forget who handed out this morning a, um, huh? Okay, and I was looking over the list here and you have Rovral, you have Rally or Nova, you have Pristine, you have Inspire, you have um, a Cabrio, you have Elevate, you have Xyram, you have Captain, you have Applause or Bravo. All of these we have already seen have some effect on honeybees. Yeah. 
In fact, uh, I was at the American Bee Federation meetings uh, in January, and there was a lot of talk about pristine. Okay, so this, this is in one test. They took 887 pollen and wax samples. Gets back to the bee sweat, but the pollen is coming directly from the flower. We've seen 120 different pesticides and their metabolites found, including all classes of insecticides, including systemics, but also 20 fungicides, 12 herbicides, two miticides, and one synergist. So there's a lot of stuff. We estimate that every pollen load a bee brings back to the hive has 6.7 different chemicals on it. And these are the top ones. And like I said, when you look at these two, these are bee, this is the beekeeper. The other ones are coming in from the field. So we have a standard LD50 test. That's what we, the EPA has been using for years and years. Well, it only, has a, it only is a test of the acute toxicity of the current adult bee population. It doesn't test the larvae. It doesn't test the queen. It doesn't test the eggs. So isn't an accurate statement when, you, when you're talking about the effectiveness or the, or the lethality of a chemical towards a bee colony. We're looking at no test, but this is changing. This year we're starting to set up guidelines for chronic uh, exposure to larvae in, as a testing mechanism for um, all chemicals. The EPA is helping with that. We're having um, chronic mortality, just to explain it. It accumulates within the adult bees or any of the following generations that are fed contaminated pollen and nectar by nurse bees. It can affect the larvae, the eggs, the queen. It's queen's re reprodu reproduction and navigation in the adult bees. That's where we get these bees flying off and not know where their homes are. And you have sterility in drones. So when the drones and the queen mate, they're not getting the punch that they used to. Some of our native bees are smaller than our honeybees. If, if the LD of a 50 is one value, would that value be as accurate for a native bee? If you have an example here, I just put this up, it's imaginary. If a honeybee weighed a pound, and it takes four ounces of that material to be a lethal dose, would that be the same dose that would be lethal to a four ounce orchard bee that's out there? Or would it be four times as much as you need to kill that orchard bee? We don't want to pollinate our flowers by hand. All right. This is happening in some parts of the world already. They've killed off everything. So let's talk about native pollinators. I'm going back to this one. Is this a bee? It's a fly. There are other things out there besides bees that are doing pollination. Are there LD50 for them is going to be the same as, you know, so we have to think about these things more and all. Pollinators of many of our fruits, vegetables, and flowers, and many of our plants are not always honeybees, which are an introduced bee from, uh, to North America. Many different kinds of native insects that pollinate, including bumblebees, other native bees, flies, beetles, moths, butterflies, and in some parts of the country, even bats. Problem, very few of these pollinators can be controlled by man like the honeybee colonies are. I mean, either you have them or you don't have them. This thing wants to jump on me. <laughs> Many native pollinators only utilize the pollen, so it doesn't give the beekeeper as much of an incentive if he's only going to be pollinating and he's not going to make any honey. So to even do the, all the extra work for this, he's not making as much. Is that a bee? That's a potter wasp. Different kinds of flowers can attract different kinds of native pollinators. Some flowers are very successfully pollinated by bees. Other flowers, especially tubular flowers, are not. See, there it goes again. As, po as active as pollinator. Because that's where moths and butterflies come in because they have the longer tongue. They can stick down these tubular flowers and do, do the pollination. All right. Now this, these here are our main four. 
alkali bees, which we do not have here. These are Western bees, and they specialize in clover. You have leaf, alfalfa leaf cutter bees, which again uh, specialize mostly in clovers, but you do find them on other plants. You have the honey bee. You have the orchard mason bee, which has a limited time of availability. And you have the bumblebee. Some native pollinators are social and living groups, such as the bumblebee. There are four types of bumblebees here on the eastern shore. You have two in the spring, and you have two in the summer. Some reasons bumblebees make good pollinators. Their size makes it easier to contact the sexual parts of the flower and carry larger pollen loads. A bumblebee, when it comes into a blossom, let's say an apple blossom or a peach blossom, it goes right down on top of it and just smears it everywhere and takes that pollen off and takes that honey off and goes off on his way. Whereas a honeybee, he's a little bit more sneaky about it and he comes in by the side and he nibbles his way around. So he gets not as much pollen on him, so he's not as effective, but he gets all the nectar he can because they're more interested in that nectar. Okay, bumblebees are more tolerant a bad weather. You can see when it's raining, you can actually see bumblebees out there flying. How they fly, we still haven't figured that out, but they do. But they, they will forage in rain and in strong winds. They will fly at cooler temperatures where honeybees have union rules and do not start flying until it's 55 degrees. Bumblebees will be out there at about 50. So, they also visit flowers earlier in the day. I mean, you know, it, when you think about a bum, honeybee getting out there at about 5 a.m., bumblebees are already working for an hour before that. So, they can visit more flowers per minute. Ding, ding, ding. What's the problem with using, this sounds amazing. This sounds like a good idea. What's the problem with bumblebees? Well, there's several. First off, and this is the most important, they do not recruit each other to the nectar resources. Whereas the honeybee comes back and he does his little, he says, over here, over here, and then everybody else can fly over there and get it. A honey, a bumblebee comes back and he says, I'm not telling anybody where I find my stuff. I'm just going to keep it to myself. <laughs> so you have a problem with that. And so the communication is a very long and stretched out time period where between when the first bumblebee finds a resource and the next bumblebee finds the resource. So it takes a little while. So, and it's all made, uh, these decisions are all made on reward. You know, if they're getting a lot of nectar, if they're getting a lot of pollen, they'll go back. If they don't, they move on. You have an annual life cycle. It's only the new queens that overwinter every year. The one new queens for the following year. And because of that, you only have small colony populations with bumblebees. At the most, about, what, 300? 300 bumblebees to a box if you buy it. That's about all you get. So it takes time to build up to that population, and it could, not, it could be a thing where it doesn't overlap when you're actually needing it in your fields. So it's one of the problems. They're poor domesticators. I mean, if they don't like it, they leave. So you have a little problem with keeping them in a place. But this is probably the key factor the last one, fly later in the day. Why would this be a problem for your for vegetable or fruit growers? Sprays. So you, you know, you're more likely to be killing your bumblebees population because of that late flight during the time when you're trying to spray. But we can conserve wild bumblebees. These are free bees. They're living around us. They'll be in our fields. If we can do things like Notice where they are coming from. Do an inventory of your bee yard. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. Bumblebees nest in grassy thatch, abandoned rodents nest, and bales of hay. So if there's stuff like that in your operation, don't disturb it. Wait and see. See if something comes. Need to leave areas around the fields unmowed. Now, you don't have to permanently unmow them, and uh, NRCS is recommending a three-year cut. That's to kill off the, the perennials or the trees that would be growing. Uh, but you don't want, you know, you don't want, you want to keep as much of that low area undisturbed so that other native bees may be able to adapt. These areas should not be disturbed by heavy machinery. They should not be sprayed with insecticides or tilled, you know. 
they need, well, one of the keys to it is, yeah, you could build one, you throw out some daisies that come up in June or July, but what about the rest of the year? You need a complete succession of flowers that will cover the whole growing season so that there's resources available to these bees or bumblebees or wild bees. Oh, I went the wrong way again. All right, these are mason bees. Has anybody here seen mason bees on their apples? All right. Good. I don't go back. Damn. I'm way off now. All right. I have given classes in raising these mason bees. Another, this is another thing. There are very few beekeepers that raise mason bees. And it's the same thing with you buy, if you personally buy that box of bumblebees, it's your responsibility. If you buy that box of honeybees from me, it's my responsibility to make sure those bees are doing their job. One of my biggest beefs right now with growers that rent or, or buy the bumblebee boxes is, we have now found that uh, small high beetles love to live in there. And they've become a reservoir for small high beetles getting back into my pods. So there's, there's a, uh, we, we really are trying to get people to dispose of those boxes after their season's done with them. All right, so these guys again, look where they land on these flowers. They're right on top of it, just like a bumblebee. And these are very active bees. Mason bees are excellent pollinators, but only for fruit trees. They can be raised by men and smite and made colonies, but are, they are solitary. One, queen, one female bee will fill up one tube. They don't have more than one going into it. So you need a lot of them to get started. Then it's nice that you can get these, these kits where you can buy these, these cardboard tubes, but if you can't, you can use the uh, tubes that you get all your dry cleaning on. Just fold them in half. You put them in, don't use PVC because it sweats and it'll get all these wet and then they're not effective. Uh, you can get disease in them. If you have the liners inside, you can remove the liner because these that are the queens will be coming out of will not go back to. So you have to always have a mixture of good, clean, empty nesting sites and nesting sites. You don't even have to use these straws. You can use raspberry canes. You can use Phragmites. Find a use for that damn Phragmites that we have in the yards, you know, fields. And so we, there's a lot of different materials that can be used to raise these guys in. I use milk, uh, wax-coated milk cartons. I use the Quaker oat two cans, raisin cans, anything that would fit it. The key is this tube has to be eight inches long. If you don't, then you mess up the sex ratio and the population will get into trouble. So what are the reasons for using mason bees? They're, they're ease of care, they're really easy. Once they do their job, then you package them up, you put them in a garage, keep them for the rest of the year, and then bring them out in the next spring. That's it though. They're only good in the spring. They only are available to us as a pollinator in late or early April through mid-June. And then that's it, that's it for the year. So they're great for fruit trees, they work really well on apples and peaches. And there's an example, you need 250 nesting females. You get six, you get, in a straw you may get three females, maybe four. So how many straws would you need to make 250 nesting? So you know, you have to do a little bit of calculation, but for an eye, you can get a 250 nesting female, Females will pollinate an acre of apples or peaches. Obviously, they're flying in cooler weather. They're more efficient as pollinators, again, because of the way they land on the flowers. They like to fly when it's windy. They fly longer into the day. That could be a problem, though, with the spray schedules. They visit more flowers per forage flight than honeybees or bumblebees. So they're really zipping. They're boom, 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 boom. But sometimes they get nailed. Uh, sometimes people mix things together in a spray. Let's say you're spraying an antibiotic, streptomycin or something. Well, streptomycin, as you know, won't stay on the plant if you just spray it straight. So you have to add something to it, a spreader or a sticker or something. Well, when you put that sticker in there and you spray it on these apple blossoms when those guys are active, what's happening to them? All of a sudden, 
They're stuck. They can't move. They're glued together. You know, and it's not, you know, unless you realize that, you know, it's just an issue. So beware. Mason bees are only active, like I said, in early spring, only effective on fruit and nut crops. These are solitary bees without communication, so one queen does not tell the next queen where the nectar sources are. Everybody has to find it on their own. So what else other? What else is out there? Well, there are over 123 known species of wild bee in our local environment, right here. And we've done surveys to prove that. Such native species belong to the, found, the groups of apidae, halictids, which are swift bees. You have megachilids, adrenids, collectids, xylocopids. Everybody likes to take the old badminton to the, to the xylocopids. You know, so, but these, they are, they're good contributors to many agricultural situations in our region. Xylocopids, not so much. But they are, very, they are the most important pollinator of passion fruit in the south. Many other bees are solitary. They live in a variety of soils or other nesting sites. Many are flower specific, so we're unable to use them effectively. And this is all has to be considered out. Butterflies, moths, and flies, beetles, also contributed to an effective pollination of many plants in our environment. So just, just the bees themselves. We estimate, I think, something like $20 billion of, of, of industry is produced by honeybees. Well, if you could take a third of that to a quarter of that and say wild bees are actually doing that and honeybees are getting the credit for it. So this is some of the bees we have around here. Melisodes is a digger bee. It lives in the soil. This is a great pollinator. Uh, we, when we did our surveys, it was one that we found quite a lot of in our surveys. It's uh, uh, around us all the time. We, one of the neat things is it doesn't bring the pollen back on its leg. It brings it back on its belly. This is Calides. It's another one we find in our survey. They're called the polyester bee because they're in their secretions, they, they, they produce a material that's like polyesters. They use it to waterproof their, their tunnels in the ground. Here's one that's been tried to be manipulated. This is uh, the squash bee. It's a much more effective pollinator of our cucurbits than well, honeybees do. But the pro whoop. one of the problems we have with it is the way they're doing it right now is, is you have to collect thousands of these larvae and carry them to the next squash field that you're going to be wanting pollinated and release them, release those guys. And maybe a third will take and maybe two thirds will fly away and go somewhere else. So we're still working on trying to manipulate this little guy, but uh, so far we're not having much success. So what can you do? Do you want to have more native bee pollinators in your, in your uh, operation? Well, like the old saying, if you build it, they will come. So what you have to do, and of course I don't have this in, li in line, but I think the first thing you would need to do is inventory your land for existing nesting sites. I love going into watermelon places watermelon growers and I walk into their field and they got this huge nesting site for melisodes or for collectees and they're plowing it every year. So they're knocking back that population that they have available to them for pollination later. So inventory your land and then this will give you an idea about whether or not you can incorporate some of those areas that are nesting sites now into put aside places. All right. So you want to, and then you want to create those. You have to think long term with these guys. It isn't that they're going to move in tomorrow. It's going to be a long term project that you'll be doing to get these uh, type of bees established. And with the, some of the things you can do is increase the availability of water or moist areas in your agricultural landscape. We don't have too much to worry about except in July and August. Uh, you want to introduce or reintroduce wildflowers and plants for forage and nesting. Remember, these flowers have to be something that begins in March and ends in October. You have to have that whole swath. Okay, you want to have numerous nectar bearing crops, not only pollinating crops, but nectar bearing crops, dependable season long food resources, 
And like I said, you can mow it about every three years. And you want to reduce your pesticide use, especially in nesting habitats. And this gets back to what we were talking about with this, this neonic problem that we're having now with the dust blowing out of the cedars and drifting over into these. If you had a put aside area, you wouldn't want that dust to drift into it and kill everything that's in that area. So this is what you want to do. I have a handout that I'll set outside. Basically, it just kind of is an overview of of the different bee families and their nesting sites and whether they're a generalist or a specialist and a few other things. So if you're interested in that. The other thing is, all right, when you do this inventory, and you don't know what the heck you got. I, I agree. You're not, you're not an entomologist. You're not a beekeeper. Just put it in some alcohol or, or freeze it in a baggie and get it to me or call me and I'll check it out and I'll tell you, well, this is what you got and we'll go out and we'll look at this area so we can, we can set up these areas and try to, you know, enhance these populations in your own operations. Don't just throw it away. Let me know what you got. All right, that's it. Any questions? Yeah. Well, most of the time you'll find that you have these squash bees, and if you don't, they're down in that blossom, and if you don't know, they're, they're very small, they're, and most of the time they're doing all the pollination. Yeah. Bees get a lot of credit for things they don't do, and that's one of them. Um, they, uh, but a lot of your squash has to be pollinated before 10 o'clock in the morning. So you may be missing because you're going out later than that. Uh, the blossoms usually they'll run out of juice or they'll close themselves up about 10 o'clock in the morning and you don't see bees active in those fields again. Now the tomatoes and peppers and eggplant, that's a whole other technology. That's called buzz population, pop pollination. And usually bumblebees are very effective at that. It's the vibration of their bodies or their wings going by the blossom shakes the pollen out and causes it to fertilize. So that's why they use them in greenhouses. It's, it's actually... We used to use electric toothbrushes until we figured out bumblebees will work in, in the uh, greenhouses. So that, that's uh, a different type of pollination altogether. Any other questions? All right, okay. great. Thanks.